Games has always been the most popular category in the Google Play Store. And although we all use productivity apps like an email client or an instant messaging service, gaming is still an important part of the mobile experience. And therefore it's no surprise that when people want to start developing for Android, they often say, I want to write a game. And let's be honest, it's actually much more fun than writing a productivity app. Well today I'm gonna to show you how you can write your very first game using the Corona SDK for Android. To get started with Corona, you need to download and install the SDK. Go to the Corona website and hit the download button. You'll need to create an account which is free before you can download it. If you want to build actual APK files rather than just running the program in your emulator, you'll also need to download Java 7. You can find all the links you need in the written companion to this video. Once you've installed Corona, you need to activate it. This is a one-time process, which is free. Start the Corona simulator and agree to the license. Enter the email address and password which you use for the download and click Login. From within the Corona simulator, click on New Project. Enter the name of your app in the Application field and leave the rest of the settings at their defaults. Now click on OK. Three windows will appear. The first two are the Corona simulator and the Corona simulator output. Corona will also open a file explorer window showing the files for your project. Now the majority of those files, some 23 of them, are for the application icon across all the different platforms that are supported by Corona. However, the most important file for us right now is main.lua, as this is where you will write the code for our game. Before we start writing the game, we take a whistle-stop tour of the Lua programming language. Now, the interpreter is actually available for Windows, Linux, and for OS X, and it's also built into the Corona SDK. However, the easiest way to play around with Lua is to use the online live interpreter, and you'll find a link to that in the written companion that accompanies this video. Here is a small Lua program which shows you some of the key features of the language. The code shows three important Lua constructs, functions, loops, and if statements. The function double it is very simple, it just doubles the passed in parameter. The main code is a for loop which runs from 1 to 10 and it calls double it for each iteration. If the return value is 10, i.e. i is 5, then the code prints out the word 10, otherwise it prints out the number, the result of the double it function. Writing games in Corona is really simple. You only need to worry about one file, main.lua, and you let the Corona SDK do the rest of the heavy lifting. Now today the game we're gonna write is a simple tap game. A balloon or a bomb will fall down the screen and the user needs to tap it. If they tap on a balloon, they score a point. If they tap on a bomb, then as a penalty, their score gets divided by two. And to start writing the game, all you need to do is edit the file main.lua in any text editor that you have available on your system. The Corona SDK has a built-in 2D physics engine, which makes building games very easy. The first step in writing the game is to initialize the physics engine. The code is quite simple. The module physics is loaded and initialized. It's assigned to the variable called physics. To enable the engine, we just call physics.start. Next, we need to create some helpful variables, which will be useful not only for this simple game, but also for more complicated games. Half W and half H hold the values of half of the screen width and half of the screen height. The display object is a predefined object which Corona makes globally available. Now the first step that actually makes something happen to the screen is to set the background image. As well as properties like content height and content width, the display object also has a lot of useful functions. The new image function reads an image file, in this case a .png, and displays it on the screen. Display objects are rendered in layers, so since this is the first image we are putting on the screen, it means it will be the background. The parameters half w and half h tell Corona to place the image in the middle. At this point, you can run the program in the emulator to see that you've changed the background image. If you save the file, the emulator will notice that it has changed and offer to relaunch the emulator for you. If that doesn't happen, just go to File Relaunch to set the whole thing in motion. Since the user will score points for tapping on balloons, we need to initialize a score variable and display the score on the screen. The score will be kept in a variable called score and the score text is the object which displays the score. Like new image, new text puts something on the screen, in this case text. Since score text is a global variable, we can change it from anywhere we like during the code, but we'll get to that in a minute. 
You can now relaunch the emulator again and see the score of zero displayed near the top of the screen. Now comes something a bit more tricky, but don't worry, I'll explain it line by line. We're going to write a function called balloon touched, which will be called every time a balloon is tapped. We haven't yet told Corona that this is the function we want called every time a balloon is tapped, but when we do, this is the function that will be called. Tap or touched events have several stages, mainly to support dragging of objects. When the user puts their finger on an object, this is the began phase. If they slide their finger in any direction, that is the moved phase. When the user lifts their finger from the screen, that is the ended phase. The first line of the balloon touched function checks to see that we are in the began phase. We want to remove the balloon and increment the score as soon as possible. If the function is called again for another phase like ended, then this function does nothing. Inside the if statement are four lines of code. Let's deal with the last two first, as they are simpler. Score is equal to score plus one just increments the score by one. And score text dot text is equal to score changes the score text on the screen to reflect the new score. Remember how I said that score text was global and it could be accessed from anywhere? Well, that is what we've just done. Now for the first two lines. Once a balloon or bomb falls off the bottom of the screen, it still exists in your app's memory, just that you can't see it anymore. As the game progresses, the number of off-screen objects will steadily increase. Therefore, we need to have a mechanism which deletes objects once they're out of sight. We do that in a function called off-screen, which we haven't written yet. That function will be called once per frame during the game. Once a balloon has been tapped, then we need to delete it and remove the call that checks if the balloon has gone off screen. The line event.target colon remove self deletes the balloon. When a touch event occurs, one of the parameters of the listening function is event. It tells the function about the event and what type of event it is. It also tells us which object was tapped. We find that in event.target. The remove self function does just what it says it does. It deletes that object. The line before that removes the enter frame listener, which is the function that is called every frame to see if the balloon has fallen off the bottom of the screen. We will look at that in more detail when we come to write the off screen listener function. So to recap, balloon touch checks to see if we're at the beginning of a touch sequence. It then removes the enter frame listener, which is the function that is called every frame to see if the balloon has fallen off the bottom of the screen. It then deletes the balloon itself, increments the score and displays the new score. Well, that was for balloons. Now we need something similar for bombs. As you can see, the code is very similar with the exception that rather than incrementing the score, the score is multiplied by 0.5, i.e. divided by two. The math.floor function rounds down the score to the nearest integer. So if the player had a score of three and tapped a bomb, then the new score would be one and not 1.5. I mentioned the off-screen function earlier. This function will be called every frame to check if an object has gone off the screen or not. There is a special situation in computing known as a race condition. This is where two events can happen almost simultaneously and we're not sure which event will happen first. Now we have a race condition in this game that we're writing. 30 times a second, the function is being called to check if the balloon or the bomb has fallen off the bottom of the screen. The problem is when you tap on a balloon or a bomb, we want to delete that balloon or bomb from the game. But then 30 times a second, we're also checking to see whether that balloon or bomb has fallen off the bottom of the screen. And these two things can be in conflict with each other. So therefore we need to write some special code to make sure we don't try to check if a balloon has fallen off the bottom of the screen that we're actually in the middle of deleting. To get around this odd sequence of events, the off-screen function needs to check if the Y value of the object is nil. If it is nil, then it means the object is already being deleted. And so we move on. This is not the balloon we're looking for. If the object is still in play, then check its position. If it has gone 50 pixels off the screen, then delete it and remove the listener so that the off-screen function won't be called again for this object. The code that makes sure that the off-screen function is called every frame comes a little bit later. 
The whole premise of our game is that a new bomb or balloon will fall down the screen at a regular interval. So therefore we need a function that adds that new balloon or bomb to the game. The first line of the function decides where the balloon will drop from on the x-plane. If the balloon or bomb always dropped in the middle, that won't be very interesting. So start x is a random number between 10% and 90% of the screen width. Next, a random number is picked between 1 and 5. If the number is 1, then a bomb is dropped. If it's 2, 3, 4 or 5, then a balloon will be dropped instead. This means that bombs will be dropped around 20% of the time. The bomb and balloon code are quite similar. First the image, either a bomb or a balloon, is displayed using the new image function. Its x position is set to that of start x, while its y position is set to minus 300, i.e. 300 pixels off the top of the screen. The reason for that is that we want the object to fall from the outside of the screen, into the visible area and then off the bottom again. Since we are using the 2D physics engine, it's a good idea to give the object a bit of an initial distance so it can gain some speed during its fall. The call to physics.addbody takes the image loaded by the new image function and turns it into an object in the physics engine. This is really quite powerful. Any image file can be made into a physics body that responds to gravity and collisions, etc. just by calling physics.addbody. The last three lines of the bomb or balloon code set up the listeners. Setting the enter frame property tells Corona which function to be called every frame, and the call to runtime add event listener sets that up. Lastly, the call to balloon add event listener tells Corona which function to call if the balloon or bomb is tapped. And now the game is almost complete. We just need two more lines of code. The first line makes the initial balloon or bomb fall by explicitly calling add new balloon or bomb. The second line sets out a timer which will call add new balloon or bomb every half a second. This means that a new balloon or bomb will fall into the game every half a second. You can now run the game in the emulator. The next step is to build the game for a real Android device. To build a .apk file, click on File, Build for Android, and fill out the fields. The result will be a .apk file which you can copy onto your device and install. You just need to ensure that you have configured your device to allow installation of apps from unknown sources. The next thing you should try and do is improve the game. What about adding a popping sound every time you tap on a balloon, or an explosion every time you tap on a bomb? What about some background music? You could add a third object, a super boost, that comes down quite rarely, but it doubles the player's score, and so on. Now that you've started, let's see where you can go. Well, my name's Gary Sims from Android Authority, and I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, please use the comments below to tell me what you think about the Corona SDK. If you had any problems writing this game, please ask them below, and we'll see if we can help you. You should also subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel, and as for me, I'll see you in my next video.